Hi, everybody. I have such a special interview today, and I'm really excited about my guest. Tuck Watkins is here, who is currently part of the all-star cast on Netflix film version of Boys in the Band. And of course, we all love him from One Life to Live is David Vickers, Unforgettable, and Desperate Housewives, and everything else he's done. But he's with me today. And I'm so glad we're together on this today, because as we're sitting here watching what happens with the election <laughs> returns, we're nail, it's nail biter, but I follow what's happening through your Instagram, Tuck. I literally go, what state is Tuck gonna have up? <laughs> Where did you get those little state icons? You know, it, it's so funny on, I, I think it was Tuesday that when the, the results were coming in, and we were all getting a little nervous. Um, I saw, I saw this um, uh, thing on the internet where California, which as you know, is geographically immediately west of Nevada. And I looked at it and I thought, it looks like California is holding Nevada like an infant, supporting Nevada like an infant. And that's when, you know, California always goes blue. Um, uh, Nevada is, is more up in the air. And I thought if California was supporting Nevada, that I just love that picture. And so I put a happy face on California and his arms around Nevada. And um, I just posted it. I was like, come on, Nevada, you can do it. And then when these other states started coming up as, you know, which way are they, they going to go? Um, I just turned all these different states, these swing states into uh, caricatures of what they might collectively be feeling. And it took sort of a life of its own. And then- um, So you're now drawing I've, these, you're drawing these. Well, I, no, here's what I do. I go okay. online and I, I, I'll i enter, for example, Georgia. I'll enter state of Georgia, red. And then images come up on maps where you can just cut out a, a picture of Georgia, just you know, outlined as red or blue. And then I just draw faces, faces on them. And it's funny, when you look at a state, you, you don't think to anthropomorphize it or make it look human. Um, but based on what, you know, the angst that's going on in these different states, suddenly these faces popped out to me or the way that Georgia looks like if it's facing east, it has this big <laughs> belly. So, so yeah, I, I, I cut out pictures from the this internet. This is how you getting through the election. So, um, you know, we all need a little levity um, and it's, uh, it's, a, it's my political statement. So if you don't know what the heck we're talking about, just go to my Instagram page. Right, Instagram exactly. Page. Just you'll, go to Tuck Watkins' Instagram yeah. and you'll see exactly you'll see what You'll I'll see the nonsense that we're talking here. about. Let's talk about Boys in the Band for a minute because, Tuck, I loved you in this. I loved your portrayal of Hank in it. And, um, you know, I, this whole experience for you, you know, must have, it's been such a journey from the stage to this, you know, and it's kind of changed your life in more ways than one, I see. Yeah, so it really has. It really has. And, you know, what did you think about the film version? And did you have trepidation about how this was going to translate to a film version based on there is already all these other classic versions of the the play and the movie? Yeah. Well, you, um, you, you're right. This, this was more than a job. It turned out to be more than a job. It actually feels like it's part of my life um, because it went on for three years from when Joe Mantello called me when I was, I was living in Kansas City. I'd moved there with my, uh, with my two kids as a single parent, I was overwhelmed trying to raise my kids on my own. And so in 2016, in fact, two, a month before the 2016 election, I moved back to Kansas City. I sort of under the auspices of, I'm going there to vote for Hillary. Missouri needs my vote for Hillary. And um, I don't know if anybody knows, but uh, Hillary did not win. Um, <laughs> I think we know that. I yeah. Think I think we know. So, so anyway, there I was in Kansas City. I was in a park in February with my kids. My cell phone rings, it's Joe Mantello, who's this Tony award-winning Broadway director. And I, I think you got the wrong number, what's going on? And he invited me to do a reading that Ryan Murphy was producing at Voice in the Band. And that reading turned into a workshop. That workshop turned into the Broadway production that we did in 2018, which turned into the Netflix movie that we shot in 2019 that came out uh, just before the election in 2020. Um, I did not have any any trepidation or concerns about working on a Broadway play and a Netflix movie with Ryan Murphy, Joe Mantello, and the amazing guys in this cast. 
I mean, if we were going to get together and, you know, reboot, insert terrible movie here, <laughs> I would have done that movie. <laughs> <laughs> but what's so great is that everybody in the cast, by the time when it did the Broadway production first of this, everyone was openly gay. So it was a very different, you know, there's a lot going on, a lot of messing yeah, with this. That's a good yeah. point because yeah, it was, this, 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 the Boys in the Band is a reboot of, of a play and a movie from 50 years ago about what it was like to be gay in 1968 in New York City. And it was kind of like the Mark Crowley, the late great Mark Crowley who passed earlier this year, um, when he wrote this play really out of uh, frustration, um, it was like drilling a hole into the, into the apartment door of, of an apartment in, in Manhattan and seeing how um, nine gay men treat each other um, uh, behind closed doors when no one else is when no one else is looking and they support each other and they tear each other apart and that kind of thing so that was done uh sort of in um during its current zeitgeist when it was actually happening in 1968 and then we, we ryan murphy had the great idea we need more lgbt stories about our history we just do and he said, it's time for, to revive the boys in the band. And so they invited the nine of us to, to do this play. And um, it, it is important to note that things really have gotten better in so many ways, in innumerable ways for gay people. Um, you know, 50 years ago, you know, you could be arrested just for being gay. Um, you couldn't work for the government or the military. They, they printed our names in the newspaper just to humiliate us. Um, the list goes on. So you can't, we can't sit here and say that things haven't gotten better. I think Ryan Murphy was really smart to say, we, we need more stories about our history. We need to know where we came from. And I remember this uh, play as sort of this old relic of gay guys who are snarking at each other and who wants to watch <laughs> yeah, that? Right. Why are we, why are we going to reboot that? We've come so far. Let's do more cool, progressive stuff. But he's right. You know, any any culture, any especially any minority, needs to understand why they have the rights that they do now, why those rights were fought for. So, um, it's it was a really full experience. I feel like I got educated. I feel um, I, I I feel more sensitive to others um, when when others feel less than because you know as a as a middle-aged white American male, ain't nobody gonna feel sorry for me. Um, and being part of an experience like this and also being part of you know, a minority being a gay man, um, I do feel like I uh, have um, a road to empathy that, that maybe others who, who don't feel like they're part of a minority might feel. Um, and I think that's what we gotta start doing, you know, is, is just trying to feel each other's pain because um, we've been making each other feel our own pain for so long, especially the last four years, that it's 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 time to turn that corner. You and Andrew Reynolds were so I, you know it's interesting. I asked people that had seen the film. I said, "Well, who did you like? Who do you think was good? Who do you think was good? Who was good in it? Like who do you think was good?" In it? <laughs> and they're like, "I really liked the guy that played Hank and the guy that played Larry, and I thought they were really good." And the, you guys were let's just say, really wonderful in the film. And there were some very meaty emotional moments in there that I thought the beats that you played, you could feel, I mean, it was tangible, you know, just well, the relationship and the cheating and the three-way and the, he was, you know, the one, it, but there was a lot in there that people could relate to, I think, even now. I love you. Hank, why did you do that? Because I do love him and I don't care who knows it. Hank and Larry, one of them um, wants to not be monogamous. The other one um, wants the um, more um, traditional relationship. So I think we can all relate to that in one degree or another. Um, I think that, um, you know, I, I had met Reynolds, I had met Andrew Reynolds um, before we started doing the play, but I didn't really know him. And the first thing that I remember thinking about him is how affectionate he was. And that's not to say, you know, um, overly kissy, huggy, that kind of thing. He just made everyone in his presence feel good. I watched him do it and I felt that, I felt it from him. 
And then, you know, as we started doing this play, we um, life started imitating art. Um, and um, I, I, I fell in love with my co-star. I've Which never done I that. Love, I know you've never done that. <laughs> <laughs> You know, usually when there's a gay guy in the cast, it's the one gay guy. We play the one gay part. We we have to fill, you know, under the umbrella of, hey, folks, this is what it's like to be gay for everybody. Right. Um, but with uh, with these nine guys, everyone played, you know, sort of a different stripe on the tapestry. And um, was there a moment you knew you were in love with him? Someone told someone told me. Someone suggested it to me near the near the end of the Broadway run. A good friend of mine, who I don't see a lot, came to New York and saw the play. And afterwards, he said, "How long you've been seeing Randalls?" I was like, <laughs> "What?" I was like, "Well, you're right, but how did you know?" And he said, "Well, at the end, at at the curtain call, you hold each other's hand longer than you need to." And I hadn't realized that. And then it, there's a bunch of pictures on the internet of curtain calls and stuff. And I went onto the internet and looked and sure enough, we're, there we are doing it. And I thought, I think I thought at that time, I think I like him more than I think I do. And um, then when the play closed, it was the first time I'd ever done a play that I didn't want it to end. Mm -hmm. I've done a couple off Broadway plays and you know, a bunch of plays, you know, coming up through the years. And I was always kind of ready for them to end. But this one I would have done for years. It was such an incredible experience. Um, and uh, so then we went away for, for a year. Um, I went back to Kansas City. Uh, Andrew went to Los Angeles to work on Black Monday. And then um, the following spring, um, I was out in LA doing a pilot and he was doing some press. And we were like, well, we're probably gonna be spending a lot of time in Los Angeles. Maybe we should start spending some more time together. And it just kind of took off from there. Um, I think the world of him, I think he's terrific. Um, and I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm a better person just, you know, spending time with him. So, and my kids love him. So how, how is he with the kids? He's great. He's, um, he, he's kind of sassy. Um, like I'm dad. You're the dad, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm dad, and I, dad. I lay down the rules, and I say no ice cream, and he kind of goes, whatever you want. If you <laughs> ice cream, it's great. So it's great. It's actually great. <laughs> the kids get the both, best of both worlds. Kind of <laughs> yin and yang. And he, um, he, uh, he, he's, he creates characters to play with them, and my, my daughter has this, he'll probably kill me for saying this, but my daughter has a couple Barbie dolls, and he's got, he, t he takes this one, and he says, <laughs> Uh, I shouldn't even imitate it, but he basically takes this lovely Barbie doll who's wearing a doctor's outfit and says, um, I, I am Svetlana, I, uh, in my country, I am doctor, in America, I am a child agent. <laughs> and I, I, he's going to kill me for doing that. Um, suffice it to say, um, I think he has a lot of fun with them and they have a lot of fun with him and we have a lot of fun together. So uh, it, it's just been really nice. You know, I wanted to say from back when, you know, you earlier in your career to now and, you know, so many actors couldn't be openly gay and out. Yeah. It's so changed for you and so many others too. What do you remember? Like, and isn't it true that, was it the Marie Osmond show where people first learned you're having a kid? Like, wasn't that sort of the out? that out moment yeah how many people do you know that came out on the marie osmond show huh? <laughs> um right i remember here, here's the deal uh i i was everybody i know everybody i've worked with they all know i'm gay i've uh, I, I had no problem with that and i enjoyed that but i didn't um talk about it professionally for most of my career in the in the 90s and early part of the 2000s because i was scared i thought i wouldn't get it to play cool parts it was really that was really it i was just afraid and um i think what i think what happened was um the way our culture was moving um there's just not there's just not time for that anymore and once i became a dad because because I, I came out publicly i think like three months after my kids were born i just thought i don't i don't want my kids to see me deflecting or not or being afraid to be who I am. 
I, and and so, you know, I, I, I thought that the, when I had kids, I thought the first half of my life, I was 45 when I decided to do it. The first half of my life was all about me. It was great and I loved it. And the second half of my life, I want it to be about my kids. So when I make decisions, it's actually pretty easy. I don't really hem and haw about a lot of stuff because I just see it sort of through their eyes and the answer to what I should or should not do on any given subject is that is usually pretty clear. And um, that just kind of cleared up and um, it, uh, you know, I, I think people wonder, well, so what's his career gonna be like? Um, and, uh, you know, th th that's yet, we'll see, we'll see, right? I mean, right, we'll see. I did get to, I do think um, while Ryan and Joe did not um, specifically, they did not specifically set out to cast nine gay guys that were out in this production. A lot of other people were considered during the readings. There were, there were guys that were, were not um, gay that were part of it. It just happened to work out that way. Um, I also think it's illegal to specifically go out and only look for, for gay people to be in your, you know, movie and your, your play. Um, but um, when the nine of us would come together at the at the end of that play and walk out to the, the end of that stage and hold hands and take a bow as nine out proud gay actors, I got to say, it really did feel powerful. It did feel like there was providence at our back. And... Um, that this this hopefully is also about moving the needle forward so that people that come up under us um aren't as scared just just aren't as scared to be themselves like like i was and and, and others that came before me um so it, it to answer your question it just it just felt like it was the right thing to do um and i did it when um it was right for me i guess yeah absolutely um, Robin Strasser had told, I, I, I realized, wasn't her ex-husband Lawrence Luckinville your Yes. Part? So, so let's just say Lawrence Luckinville played Hank on Broadway, who is Robin Strasser's ex, correct? Husband. So yes. there, I, can you believe that little factoid? <laughs> yes. Robin Strasser's real husband played Hank 50 years ago and Robin Strasser's TV husband played <laughs> Hank in the current production. And also, there's more, because when uh, when Larry was doing Boys in the Band in 1968, they were uh, they were in their townhouse on the Upper East Side. And when I went to New York to do the play 50 years later, I Robin was generous enough to rent that townhouse to me oh. and my kids when we were there doing it. So there's oh. all sorts of things that get woven in here. You know, Robin Strasser is the greatest. We're still friends. We still talk. She she um, she just donated money to my kids readathon fundraiser for their school. She sends them care packages a lot. They send her artwork. Um, so, uh, you know, One Life to Live ended a long time well, ago. Well, I talked to her recently and she sent yeah. me love. What do you think now when you look back at One Life? All I remember is my favorite thing is when you go, my pa, my pa, he's my pa. <laughs> <laughs> for, for, for but what do you remember now is are there great memories of this to you stepping away from it or i hated the way this concluded with prospect park or like what where are you with it my 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 only thought now years after it's it's over is how much i loved working on that show it was so much fun i loved the the repertory company feel of it i loved living in manhattan and going to work you know regularly at the same place and the seasons would come and go. And then there would be the New Year's Eve party on One Life to Live that we would always shoot sometime around Halloween. And so annually these things would, would come along and it just, I gotta say, it was, it's still one of the greatest jobs I've ever had. I loved it. Um, if it came back, I would love to work on it. Um, I, I, I like that. I just like the relationships with the different people. You know, there's, it, it's just like, it's just like a family or, or school or work where there's 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 two people you really don't like and there's 25 people that you like and then there's two people that you love. And um, it was just such a great, I just look back on it and, and think how lucky I was to have been able to be part of that on and off for, for the amount of time that I got to be 
part of that. And how lucky were we to watch you play David, who was still- It was so you know, fun. Was the best, the best. I have yeah. someone here to talk to you. I'm bringing oh. it up for you. Okay. You worked with this person. Hi, Kevin. Oh boy. <laughs> That's, that's one of my, that's one of my, you know, this one guy, my, talk one to of my you TV husbands that I leave in the dust. <laughs> one, of, one of, one of your, I invited, one of, <laughs> I invited one of your TV husbands to be oh, on. Wait, this. There's going to be more TV husbands. I said, I was told <laughs> I was the only one. Are there more? <laughs> no. There's Kevin oh. Rom folks. Kevin Rom, ladies and gentlemen from Desperate Housewives. And, uh, and and my God, your golf tournament, Kevin. Yes. Did you see the amount of money? I mean. Tuck was there. Tuck was there. Tuck sang. Yes. He sang? He sang. I played the tennis racket. And oh, you, played, which, when, you were the only one that had the gumption <laughs> to play the tennis racket. And I am proud of you. <laughs> he played. What did you sing? We all sang Soul Man together. Soul Man, yeah. Oh, with, Soul Steve, Man. With, with Steve Cropper, who was the original guitar player. And, yeah. And Kevin, you, you correct me if I'm wrong, you raised over half a million dollars? Yes, five hundred and eleven thousand wow. dollars. That's that's amazing. It amazing. broke it. It was it's the best one for it's the best best virtual event for St. Jude so far during the pandemic. And was this congratulations? The, congratulations on that. It was really yeah. amazing. And I saw the video that was so amazing. You were so moved by the event and the amount of money that was raised. And kudos to you. Yeah. To everyone, I mean, it, it takes obviously it takes a lot of people to get that done, and um, with with KRG and uh, Momentum Transportation and all of our sponsors, and uh, I mean, Alora, not Alora. Oh, I can always mispronounce the name. Anyway, but I, everyone, with everyone's help. I mean, it it took a whole group of people to get that done, and my friends like Tuck who showed up to did videos for me that we put in. I mean, it was it was everyone together, and that's I part of my getting moved is. I'm always impressed that when I call my friends and the people I've worked with before, they, they go, yeah, I'll do that. I'm like, oh, well, thanks. I <laughs> appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, anything for Kevin Rom. Everything for Kevin, did you, have you watched Tuck and Boys in the Band yet? Or no? I haven't seen it yet. No, it's on my queue. <laughs> it's in your queue. I haven't even seen the last ep last 10 episodes of uh, Madam Secretary yet. So I'm, I'm behind. You're behind. Okay. So talk to me about when you guys met on Desperate Housewives and you were playing this gay couple on the show, which was mm -hmm. new to the show. Cause we're talking kind of like historically, Tuck and I are like going back a little bit about, you know, actors being out in Hollywood and gay representation and how things have changed. And, and what do you remember about being Bob and Lee and first being on that? So let me, I, lead, let me lead please. here, Kevin. Let me lead please, here. Please, please, please. When I was doing Desperate Housewives, here I was on this juggernaut of uh, a TV show playing a, a, a gay character and I played other gay characters in the past and I was gay in real life, but I wasn't out. And like I was saying earlier, th the only reason I wasn't out is because I was scared. I thought I wouldn't work. And um, it, was, it, was, it, it, would, it was just frightening. And so Kevin and I did a lot of press together and we would walk red carpets. And um, maybe it's because we're a little bit of Bob and Lee in real life. and. <laughs> And, and I was the tall one and Kevin was the funny one. And, and so we'd go down the red carpets and people would ask questions. And, you know, um, every now and then it would come up like, well, are you gay in real life? Or, or you know, very pointed things that, that I was concerned about at, you know, answering because, you know, I, I was afraid. Right. And Kevin would always come right in front and, and he would deflect and he'd be funny. And I got to say, it just kind of felt like Kevin you know, was, was, was giving me a hug. And um, that was a really lovely thing to do. Um, even though, you know, I, I think in retrospect, maybe I wasn't doing the right thing, but. Um, I think, I think you're doing the thing you can do at that time. I mean, I, it's, it's hard to look back. I mean, there's, I, I don't have that version, but I have other things that I did or didn't do because of my upbringing in, you know, crazy religion that I, I look back and go, oh, I could have done that better or whatever, but I was, we were all doing the best we can. I don't know if you but, remember this, Tuck, but we talked, we had a conversation. You sat me down when we first got cast and you're like, look, I'm on a soap, I play straight and I, obviously I'm gay, but, and I was like, it's not obvious, but okay. And you said, <laughs> and, and you said, and you said, so I'm not going to, you said, I'm not going to answer the question when they ask us that. And I go, okay, well then I won't either. And we'll just, we'll just be a united front. Yeah. And, and so but the, the funny part of that story is I, it was while we were doing that show. Well, I actually, I'd met my now wife. She was with me when I auditioned, which is another funny story. Um, right. 
right. couldn't get on the lot. And I, right. came, I remember I, that. I came in hot and pissy, but I think <laughs> it's the reason I got to do it. It worked. It, it worked. Was hot hot um, and pissy. Great. Oh, yeah. So, but I, so Amy and I, she came in town to visit me, and Eva had opened a restaurant. And Tuck and I had this deal where we weren't going to, we were going to go do it, all this press together. We weren't going to answer the question. And I show up at the restaurant opening, not thinking. And all of a sudden there's a red carpet and Amy's with me. And I'm like, oh no, I can't walk the red carpet with Amy because they're going to know I'm straight. And I don't want anyone to know either way. And so I turned to Amy and any other girl I was dating in LA up to this point, you know, Amy was from Louisiana at the time. And I said, I said, this is awkward, but I need you to not walk the red carpet with me. Yeah. And I was prepared for this blowback. And she was like, oh, I don't want to walk that red carpet with you. Yeah. And then I was like, wait, why not? She said, I'm interviewing for a job at a hospital. I don't want them to know I'm dating an actor. And I was like, that's not how I'm torn. Uh, that's great. That is great. But you know, that's, that, that is a really good example of you know, when people don't feel like they are safe to, to be who they are, it has a ripple effect. What I was doing affected Kevin's, you know, heart surgeon girlfriend. And, you know, so it's just, it's just time that we all make each other feel safe to be ourselves in front of each other. Do you guys remember working, when you were on Desperate Housewives, was Terry Hatcher the one you worked with the most? I feel like we. Um, I feel like there was. I feel like we there. got to make the rounds a little bit, don't you, yeah. Kevin? Yeah. I remember early on, some of the women would come sort of individually to us at craft service and say, <laughs> "Who are you? You're going to be my friend. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to work me." I remember the first day on set, and my maybe my first day on set. It definitely the first day with Eva. She's like she. I'd never met her before. And she runs up and she grabbed our hands and she's like, come with us, we're gonna play a game. Like during a, during a break where they were setting up yeah. lights or something like that. And we yeah. played three truths and a lie. Right. And she proceeded to your, the whole the premise of the game is you say four things about yourself, three of them are true and one of them is not. You have to guess which one it's a get to know you game. And she proceeded to list four things that knowing that three of them are true, I could have made money through a tabloid immediately. <laughs> Did you feel like, like the guys kind of went out with a whimper, like they didn't know what to do with them ultimately in terms of story? Or because I kept thinking like there was a possibility with them. I was so excited when they told us we were going to get married. I thought that was such a cool thing. And then it, honestly, that's the, it was such an anticlimactic. It was like the C storyline of the episode. And I was like, why? It just, it made me sad a little bit. I felt like, um, I felt like they got to the point where they, they, they needed fresh meat on the show. And I feel like we provided that. And I know that uh, Mark always wanted to have a gay couple on the street. Yeah. Um, but I do feel like at a certain point they got to the point where, I mean, they had to close out the women, right? They had, that was the, they were the storyline and we were, yeah. we were secondary. Well, I remember, I think it was the first season we worked on the show. I went to one of our um, directors, LS. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and I asked him a question about my character and he looked at me and he said, Tuck, what's the name of the show? <laughs> and I said, Desperate Housewives. He said, that's right. Do you have any more questions? Wow. And I said, no, no. Wow. He was being funny. But, but that, that, there was an element of truth to that. You know, mm -hmm. Let's not stop production so Tuck can figure out how his character should walk down the steps. But Tuck, do you ad lib a lot in your work? Because you people always said to me, he ad libs a lot on One Life. He ad libs a lot on One Life. No, but, that's a mis yeah. that's a misconception. I okay. I did not ad lib on One Life. Uh, it was stuff that that we would write, uh, or I would bring in, and we would rehearse it so no one felt ambushed. Um, in that kind of environment, ad libbing I think is just um, it's rude. Right. Um, and you know, on Desperate Housewives, they were pretty. Um, deliberate about their scripts wouldn't you say kevin yeah um so th that wasn't really when, when, when we had them yeah <laughs> no kidding <laughs> they would bring our scripts while we're on set in a golf cart they'd come up in a golf cart and go oh, yeah. you're saying yeah um uh but i think um being able to think on your feet uh comes in really uh handy and when you're working with someone like kevin because kevin's greatest quality is that he's quick and so that's why you got to listen. That's why you got to be a good listener. <laughs> so we pushed each other. If you're not listening, it's all going to go by. But luckily with Kevin, the stuff that he would do, like he says, would be so funny or off the wall that all I had to do was this. 
<laughs> <laughs> and it would just bounce off. Of and you. by the way, the thing is, it made it funnier. Him doing yeah, that sure. made anything I did funnier. You know, it's like well, the old. Well, the old... I even said, I think it, it's like three years into it. I, I said to Mark one day on the lane, I said, oh, you want me to say that like B. Arthur? He said, if you can do it that well. <laughs> <laughs> Mark Cherry was one of the few guys, a few uh, directors or writers that I would ask for a line reading. Because he could yeah. play every he could. one of those characters. He could. He, he could drop into, into the heart. He would drop into their voice. He would drop into their tone. And he, he's, he, you know, he came from sitcom. So he's all about the beats. It's all about the rhythm of the joke. It's like music to him. And so if I couldn't, if I didn't understand a joke or couldn't, I was like, Mark, just give me the line reading. Because I'll understand it better if I hear it. If I hear you do it, I'm like, oh, that's okay. I got yeah. it. I can do that. Yeah. Now, have you met Tuck's kids? And right? Not yet. Not yet. No. Well, he, he, you had the kids and then we moved like not yeah. long after that. Cause what are you they moved? And then I moved, and you moved and then you moved back. Yeah. 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 And Ooh. now I don't know if you've heard Kevin, but we're in a pandemic. What? <laughs> yeah. Your child is how old Kevin? She is just turned six. Six. And so two years are. Six. They'll be eight, eight in a month. Yeah. So we're two years behind. Yeah. And I have a pair of them. Yes, I know I, you guys. I, talk, I don't know. Honestly, I, I have one. And this last six months has been oh yeah hell because oh, I was so bad. We yeah. had a full we oh, had a full awful. nanny until about two months ago. So I would I would go I you know we lived in Sacramento so I would fly down to L.A. for work I'd fly to New York for work and then we had we had someone here to help out we had someone doing things you know and all of a sudden it was just me and Hunter and I don't have anywhere to go and I'm like I did not sign up for this. This is not, yeah. I'm not, I'm not staying up dad. I mean, I'm fun dad. Clearly needs, he clearly needs help. It's, uh, it's November 6th and he's still got a happy Halloween sign. I know. <laughs> we're, we're just, I have, I have okay. a pillow. I have change that. I have a pillow. <laughs> okay. I have pumpkins. Send help. I, we're, we're just now getting, we just, we have a six foot skeleton horse in the front yard that hasn't come down yet. Wow, do you really? That sounds yeah, cool. Oh yeah, I go a little nuts on Halloween. Talk, do your that. kids understand what's going on with the pandemic and how do you explain what's going on to the kids? Uh, yeah, I think they get it pretty well. Um, they call it the virus. We, we, we can't go here, we can't go there. But, and they just look at me and go, because of the virus? And I say, yeah, that, that's the deal. They, um, one thing that is great about having twins, once they get to the age of, for me, it was the age of five, mm -hmm. is they really do have each other. Mm -hmm. And since we, you know, we're in, you know, even though we're not officially in lockdown in Los Angeles anymore, we still kind of live like we're in lockdown. I think we're in lockdown. Do you have, do you have um, a family that you quarantine with at all? That they, they prefer no, but we do have what we call our pandemic pals. And so we've got like, uh, four or five friends um, that we see regularly. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so it, it 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 has been, but but homeschool it's it's awful, and here's why it's awful because so little is learned through this Zoom stuff because there's so much technical issues, and so the, the amount of learning is this, and the amount of trying to navigate the le the learning is so much bigger, and it, they're frustrated, I'm frustrated, we get frustrated at each other. And then by the time two o'clock hits, <clears throat> we remember who we are and then we start having fun together again. But, but, but navigating those hours and trying to teach your kids how to borrow from the tens column to, to pay the ones column. So that's not what I um, signed up for as, mm -hmm. as, as a parent and I'm not good at it. And it's really trying, it's very difficult. It's exhausting, and right? Exhausting. It, it, yeah. it is, it's, it's, yeah. it's, um, it's overwhelming and it encompasses almost everything. And you know, I, I, I try to stay up an hour after they go to bed at eight o'clock and sometimes I can't make it, but that means that I get up at four in the morning because I can't yeah. sleep anymore. What's a person do at four in the morning other than fret? Yeah, especially now. Yeah, especially now, I know. Kevin, it's been so nice. Thank you oh, thank so you much for me. coming on Good and surprising you. Tuck with me. I it's so nice to see you guys together. Well, when are you doing the spinoff? Yeah, when's yeah. the spinoff? The, the, Kev, the Kevin and Tuck spinoff? Yeah, what's the yeah. title? We got to think of a title. Lee and Bob um, go to. <laughs> it's it's called it, it's called the Tuck Watkins Show, starring <laughs> Kevin Ross. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm up. Sign up. I'm in. I'm in. I love it. All right, Kevin, have a wonderful Kevin's name's day. above the title. <laughs> Bye, Kevin. Good to Kevin. see you, Tuck. Bye. Bye-bye.
So I wanted to surprise you. That was, that was really nice. Surprise. I love that guy. And we never He's see each other, you know, because because our, our lives are different with different cities. And, you know, you, you do become good friends with people when, when you're working and, and then, you know, life takes you apart. And then when you get back together, even just for a few minutes on Zoom, you remember, oh, I really like that guy. He was so sweet. I said, could you surprise Tuck with me? Because goes, oh, anything for Tuck. Well, that's he really was nice. really, really sweet. Speaking of that, I had talked to Erica Slezak a few months ago, actually. Uh, yeah. You know, I've remained, you know, good friends with Erica. And Gosh, I sure like her. She, she, once again, she's like, well, I love Tuck Watkins. And she loved your David. She always talks about you. What do you remember about working with Erica? Because she still thinks the world of you also. I remember. Uh, was she intimidating? Yes. Yeah. She was intimidating. Um, but intimidating is one of those things where if you stick around long enough, it turns into admiration. If it comes from a benevolent source and she was benevolent, she did not use her super her superpowers for bad. She used her superpowers for good. And so while <clears throat> she was, um, uh, she was just so good at what she did. Um, I, I, I looked up to her. I think because she might have been taller than me. And I'm <laughs> um, you know, I, I remember, I remember when I first left One Life to Live in 1996. I remember she said to me, "I'm sorry you're leaving. I've really grown fond of you," and that just felt so good when she said that. And that was what? That's 24 years ago now. Um, I I get sort of uh, tongue tied because. I, I, I like her, I admire her, um, I had fun with her. I loved the way that she was funny. Um, it was amazing how I would watch her read a scene and then never look at it again. And she just knew it. Um, she Didn't made she things better. Did she know everybody else's lines too? Did, pardon me? Didn't she know everybody else's lines too? I remember hearing that she would know, is that true or not true? I think so. Yeah. I th she, she would, she would if, he, if he would start to fumble, she'd go, take that again <laughs> um but uh that, that was the other thing she she would do because you know you're doing so many pages that people will often get a little lost or say the wrong line and rather than stopping talk about a good listener it was erica slazak she didn't just know it was her turn to talk next she listened to what you said so if she had to change the verb tense to something to match the verb tense you used she was on it it's cool. It's it's yeah. it's it's so it's so um, fulfilling to watch people who are really good at what they do do what they do. You know, painters, architects, uh, sports figures, actors, and she's she's one of those. She's one of the she's one of the greats. And you and Bob Woods, you know, were always wonderful together too. And I wanted to know if you could say a few words about Bob because um, I love Bob too, and. Um, he always would laugh with me about scenes with you. Yeah. Love them. Well, uh, you know, it, <clears throat> this, this is what I mean about loving this kind of job because you have a different relationship or you can have a different relationship with everyone. If you show up authentically with each person, it's going to be a little different with each person. And the way it was different with, with Bob was Bob, Bob felt familial to me. He reminded, he's younger than my dad, but he reminded me of my dad. He reminded me of my grandfather. Um, and, and not because, I mean, he, he looked like him a little bit. He uh, had a grounded quality about him the way that my dad and my grandfather do, who I both really admire. So I naturally was drawn to him uh, just because of my own history that had nothing to do with him. And then when they put us together as father and son, and uh, and I kind of showed up as, you know, kind of a town idiot, and he is the soul of the town. He he had the opportunity to go. What? I don't think so. This doesn't make any sense. But he didn't, and he found a way to em embrace this sort of knucklehead. 
um, in a way that I thought that was so loving and was such a great reflection on who he was as a man and who his character was as, as, as a character. Um, that I, 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 re I you know, I've, I've known him since 1994. And so our relationship on TV, you know, it, it changes, otherwise it dies. And, and so to have gone on that journey with him in character, while at the same time, we spend just as much time in real life, you know, with each other. Again, it's, it, it's just so fulfilling. And, and I, I, I see why people who, um, you know, have, have been on, on, on daytime for, for, you know, for, for decades, it's, it's, there's something so alluring about it. If you, if you, see, if you view it through the, through, through the right lens, because, you know, a lot of times they teach you, as soon as you get on a soap opera, you got to get off the soap opera if you want to do other stuff. And maybe that was true for a while, but I don't think that's true anymore. And um, if you, if you show up like what, it, what, what this can be, as opposed to what I don't want it to be, it just, it changes the tenor of, of, of all of it. And um, I, I admire the people that, I, that, that showed me that when I was there. Would you do another soap if the right role came up? Oh, sure. Absolutely. I'm, uh, you know, I think you never say never to anything. Right. And um, if, if the people we've been talking about got together to do something, I'm in. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. Just because yeah. I like them all so much. Yeah. With Robin, going back to that, because it was really David and Dorian's relationship that everybody glummed onto and it yeah. took off from the 4th of July speedo. <laughs> there were just so many moments yeah. through the years. What was it, A, like working with Robin, because she's a tornado in herself, um, creating the relationship on screen with her? And do you have some favorite moments that you guys yeah. have? On working with Robin, again, she was so generous with me because, you know, when, when, when I first started on the show, I was this cool, mysterious con man who would come to town to steal money and diamonds and marry the wrong people. And I did that for a year and I wasn't very good at it. And, um, you know, when you're on a, when you're on a soap with, a, or any show with a cast of characters, if you find yourself being redundant, you're not going to stick around. And I felt very aware of that. And one day I, I, I've told the story a lot, so I won't belabor the story, but the idea was one day I realized that David was not a cool, mysterious right. con man. He thought he was a cool, right. mysterious con man. Right. And that's where everything changed. And <clears throat> Robin was very um, generous about that. It's, it's sort of like going to your spouse and saying, you know what, I'm not, I'm not gonna be the person you married. I'm not going to be that person anymore. Now, do you still want to be my spouse? That's a big ask. Um, and, you know, in, in a long-term relationship on a TV show, especially on, on, on daytime, that, that's a, that's a, that's, that is a long-term relationship. And so while that ship was, was turning, she was uh, generous. The thing that I think really worked was David and Dorian, the reason they um, worked over time is because they never quite got each other. They never quite got together for real. They would get together and it would slide or it would, it would fall apart. And throughout all of it, I think the thing that, that worked that I really felt from Robin that I, that I appreciated and admired in her is that she wasn't having most of it. Dorian wasn't. But underneath it all, she loved David. You could tell it. And David loved her. And he, he, they would make each other nuts. But I think people felt there's more to it than just this War of the Roses, these two people that bicker. There was more to it. And I think it's because um, I know Robin Strasser loves me. And that's a big deal. And it makes me feel great. And I hope she knows that I feel the same way about her. And I think that really comes through. Um, it came through with me and Randall's and, and Boys in the Band. Um, you know, the, the affinity I have for Kevin Rahm on Desperate Housewives. It, we're talking about chemistry, aren't we? That's what we're talking about. That's right. And when, when you have it, it, it is palpable and it, it makes everything almost, almost effortless. Did you have a favorite scene with Robin or David Dorian? Anything come to mind? There was a scene in, in, in La Boulet, La Boulet. In her kitchen. <laughs> When they gave her this really nice kitchen with a fancy island and 
clients and all that kind of stuff. And there was a scene where um, she was making something fancy and I was eating it like a knucklehead. And then she and I, I'm wearing oven mitts and I think I may have been wearing an apron, but maybe not much more. And we just get playful in the kitchen, like with powdered sugar or something. And it sort of took on a life of its own. And I just, I, I just remember that um, playful, that's the word that comes to mind. And um, I, 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 I just loved playing with Robin. We had a lot of fun playing together. And that, that was a scene where we just got to play. Did you there's so many. I mean, it's over, so over decades. There's, there's, just, so there's so many, but that's one that comes to mind. Did you and Matt Bomer ever talk about your time on the soaps together or not? Um, we were so busy talking about other stuff. <laughs> um, I'm sorry. We did. I mean, I don't, I don't know if he and I crossed. He was, was it another world he was on? Guiding light. I, I, Guiding I guess light. since I don't, I, I guess the answer to that question is we didn't talk about it much. Got it. Um, I think we were really into what we were currently working on and um and we both lived in st louis we talked about that um and i i, I think we, we when it would come up we would talk about it fondly i think i, I run into other people that, that talk about their time on a on soap as sort of uh uh the end of a punchline they use it as a punchline or a something that they escaped or came away from. And I don't think Matt felt that way. And I certainly, as we can see, I didn't feel that way. Wrapping up with you, were you in the end result when you looked at Boys in the Band and saw it for the first time, the film version, when you, were you like, oh, we did good. Or like, what is, what did you think of it? Did you watch the totality of it? Because it's different than when you're in it and then you see, yeah. it. you know what I mean? Here's how I felt about it. I felt when we, when we finished the Broadway run, in 2018, I felt sad. I felt like I had lost something. Um, and then when we, a year later, when we finished the movie, I felt complete. I felt, you can probably hear children right in the hallway. Mm -hmm. um, I felt, um, I, I felt like we had completed something and it felt really good. It felt like we had um, thoroughly inspected it. We had taken something that we admired or, or came to admire because I didn't really understand it. I came into it, you know, with um, prejudice, I think, and then exited with a better understanding of it, of myself, of you know the, the people around me, and it it felt it felt right when when that when that concluded. Like a three sixty all the way around button. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Brian Hutchison was wonderful in it too in the scenes with you. You know, everyone's, everyone's terrific yeah. in it. And the thing that I really like about the, the movie, not more than the play, but different than the play, is so much of what we did. And like Kevin was saying, a, a lot of what I do in that production or in that, in the boys in the band, what Hank does is he witnesses a lot of things. And on stage, you know, the person in row double C R can't see can't any see of that. that. But, um, uh, the, the editor directs your eye in a, in a film. And I feel like a lot of people have said, you know, your, um, your relationship with Larry is more pronounced or um, just more. And the truth is it was, the, it was kind of the same. It's just that you were forced to look at us on, on different cuts or whatever. Um, but, but I think, you know, you look at it and well, they say if, if, if you're at a poker table and you can't pick out the, the sucker, then you're the sucker. I don't think anybody in that movie is the weak link. So, no, I don't know. Yeah. You, <laughs> you can't see it. <laughs> well, Tuck, it's been so great to see you and to talk you to you. You too, and Michael. I, I always I like talking really, to you. I really love talking to you and reconnecting with you and seeing you again. And, Thank you. and I'm happy you found love and all of that. So am I. Yeah. Thank you.